Coming up on College Press Box. Texas held the nation's best offense to just 28 points and still lost. The softball team took to the diamond the first time this season, while the volleyball team took to the court against Iowa State and Kansas. All that and much more, it's College Press Box. Good evening and welcome to this edition of College Press Box. My name is Julian Owens and with me in the studio tonight is Peter Splendoyo. Peter, how was your weekend? It was really good, Julian. We got some good college football upsets, some MLB playoffs. I really can't complain being a sports fan. None of us can complain except for the Texas fans. Well, let's talk about the Texas Big 12 homework against Baylor. Despite the Horns losing 28 to seven, what did you take from this game, Peter? Well, I think we saw that Texas can play defense under Charlie Strong. Bryce Petty had his worst game with Baylor. Um, they didn't score an offensive touchdown until midway through the third quarter. So Baylor was shut down against that Texas defense. The problem was the Longhorns couldn't move the ball on offense. That was the only problem for the Horns. This past Saturday, the Longhorns faced Baylor Bears in hopes of going 2-0 in Big 12 play. Let's go to Dick here and see how that plan played out for them. As you see, the Horns with Quandre Diggs running through the tunnel to start the game off and trying to go off strong. Now, fourth and six. There's a field goal block, but Terrell Burton will go in for the 62-yard touchdown to get Baylor up by seven. And then, as you see, Tyrone just gives it to Jonathan Gray, and he runs it for six, 26 yards. You should see he's trying to go through the Baylor defense. And then Bryce Petty, he goes in, try to get into the end zone, but he can't turn over on downs on the UT one-yard line. And now Tyrone, he goes and throws it to Alex Taylor, who goes in for 23 yards over the little, little screen. Texas is now moving the ball. Again, Tyrone. He's going to try to throw it, and he goes straight to Malcolm Brown for 21 yards. And it looks like he got into the end zone, but unfortunately, a holding call will bring them right back, so there will be no score. And now Tyrone will try to run it, and again, he's short and can't get to the score. So now going to half, Texas will be down 7-0. And now we're going straight into the second half, and you see Tyrone throws it to John Hitch for a 34-yarder. We'll have two defenders but the onslaught begins. Bryce Petty, he's looking, he throws it straight to Goodley for a 30-yarder, and it's going 14-0. Now, again, Bryce Petty throws it straight to Corey Coleman, who gets a 34-yarder, and the score is now 21-0. Now, Texas is trying to get back in the game, 28, 28 points, Tyrone will throw it straight to Marcus Johnson for a 17-yarder, and now Texas is moving the ball first down. Now, Tyrone, Malcolm, I mean Jonathan Gray, goes straight into the whole end zone, 28-7. Texas looks like they're trying to make a comeback. Unfortunately, Tyrone goes one more time, tries to throw it in the end. He gets intercepted, and now Texas will lose the game 28-7. You just see Orion Smith just running the clock a little bit, just moving it. And now Texas is down 2-3, and 1-1 one one in Big 12 play. Joining Peter and I in the studio is our very own Jeff Barker, who went to the game. Jeff, how are you doing today? Doing well. Julian, Peter, thanks for having me, guys. It's always great to have you, Jeff. Before we get into the talk, we have a clip from Coach Strong and company, how they felt about this past game. Brian, and uh, I, I look back Saturday, we chunked the ball down the field like four times. Once we got a pass interference, the next time one bounces off of our shoulder. And, you know, I think, what, two, and then another one we threw down the sideline but it, it's got to be you got to get a chunk yardage play to kind of get everything going which we haven't gotten yet Baylor they're probably what top five in the country with their all-around offense or whatever but you know it just shows you that we're able to do much than what we've been showing so it just gives us hope and confidence that we'll be able to do the same thing against them. All right, Jeff, let's get right into our talk. Texas tried to hold on to the majority of the first half and a little bit in the third quarter before the Bears ran away with the game. What are your thoughts on this loss against Baylor this past weekend? I mean, I think the overall takeaway that, I mean, if you were in the stadium, you watch this game, you notice that the Texas defense is clearly outplaying the offense. I mean, that that's obvious. But this was one of the weirdest games, I mean, I think I've seen in a while. I mean, Texas had a chance to make it 7-7. to seven. 
uh, going into the half, and we saw you know the Tyrone Soups fumble. But if you had told me that this Texas offense by the end of the game was going to hold, or this Texas defense, excuse me, was going to hold the Baylor offense to just three offensive touchdowns, I mean, I, I would have called you crazy. I thought for sure that Baylor was going to put up at least five, six touchdowns. Bryce Petty was going to be slinging the ball everywhere. I mean, they held him seven of 22 uh, for I think it was like 111 yards, and he did get the two touchdowns. You know, one at the or the two in the second half, but. I mean, I think that's got to be the biggest takeaway is that the defense is just out there. They're light years above the Texas offense right now. I agree. Yeah, the defense was uh, way better than the Texas offense, and that's always kind of been the case everywhere that Charlie Strong has gone. The problem is the offense doesn't look close. They finally got a good performance from the running backs for the first time in three weeks, and then the passing game didn't work. There was a comedy of errors, three turnovers. Uh, I just think they're going to have to start shoring these things up and get more balanced performances if they're going to start winning games. We didn't see it against Baylor. As good as the defense played, it wasn't enough with the offense turning it over and struggling to get through the ball. I couldn't agree with you more, both gentlemen. Now, as Peter suggested, we're going to go straight into the Texas offense. They seemed like they were moving the ball, especially with the ground game, but ultimately with Smoop throwing two picks and the fumble in the first, I mean, the one yard line, just kept the offense from scoring throughout the whole game. What is the offensive problem for the Horns, and what do they have to say about the Tyrone Swoop struggle? I mean, it seems like the, the Texas offensive issues kind of change. I mean, every single week, to be honest. I mean, the first three weeks since Tyrone took over as a starter, I mean, and even against North Texas, it was always about that offensive line, you know. Uh, they're not going to block well enough to establish a run game. It's going to be hard to pass with Tyrone, an inexperienced quarterback. Uh, and then in his first three starts, they kind of babied him a little bit with the playbook, you know, really uh, just started him with some short passes, didn't let him unleash it down the field uh, because of that offensive line, because of his inexperience. And then we see, as Peter mentioned, really able to establish a run game with that offensive line. They look like they're starting to settle in. And, I mean, now it looks like the struggle for the offense is going to be Tyrone Swoops. I mean, he can't turn the ball over. This offense can't keep shooting themselves in the foot. And aside from all the turnovers, he just looked timid. Uh, that was the best defense that he's faced so far. He looked very uncomfortable in the pocket a lot of times whenever there would be pressure. The first thing he would do is put his head down and run. Uh, for him to be better, he needs to be able to make the short passes he was making the first couple weeks, but also make longer passes and stay in the pocket. If the pocket collapses around him, he needs to step up in it and find his guys downfield. That's the only way this team's going to move the ball. We saw them running the ball pretty well, and it still wasn't enough. We were thinking that was going to be the issue. But, you know, the offensive line played pretty well. It's up to Swoops to start playing a little bit better. That's all that they can ask for. Now, it's Coach Strong talking about his weekly meeting on how the Texas defense is the best part of the team, but there's still more work to be done for the defense. Play hard, and uh, they know that we have a young offense, and we're doing what we can to uh, help them out. But I mean, I of course know and feel like we can um, we can do a lot more on the offensive side. We just gotta execute and um, do the little things right, and um, we'll be we'll be fine. Oh well, we well we talk about that on on defense. We need to get turnovers. We what we need to do on defense, and we didn't do it Saturday. We didn't. You know, we say we play good, but we got to get turnovers. Well, we got to change the field position for our offense and shorten the field for them. You know, they can't come out there every time, and we can't expect them to take the ball and drive the ball 99 yards. That, that's not going to happen. We, we need to get some turnovers. Now the Horns are 2-3 and three and 1-1 one and one in Big 12 play before they go into Dallas this weekend. Where is the team so far with you, Jeff, and where do you think the team will end by the end of the season? Well, right now at 2-3, and 1-1 one and one in conference play, uh, after that pretty poor performance on Saturday against Baylor. I think this is a team that we're going to see probably struggle to even become bowl eligible. I mean, they're going to need to win four more games to get to the six-win mark, which makes you bowl eligible. And, I mean, I could see them struggling to do that. Uh, but I think by the end of the season, I think we'll see this team improve a lot. We'll see the offensive line, like I mentioned before. I think we'll see them settle in. I think we'll see swoops settle in. Uh, but, I mean, if we don't see either of those parts of the, of the Texas team really pick it up, then I think – that, I mean, they're going to struggle. They're barely going to become bowl eligible, maybe even a five and seven season. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's where I see them right now. But I think if they can turn it around, uh, if they can finally put it all together, you know, maybe get a big road win be, or maybe beat Oklahoma next week in Dallas, get a big road win against Kansas State, big road win against Oklahoma State. I think that could be something where if we see them finally put it together, they get over the hump and then we have something to look forward to uh, looking ahead to next season. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to think that this team, the Texas Longhorns, are fighting for a, a spot in a bowl game right now. But that's exactly what they're doing. And they have a really tough stretch ahead. Um, you know, they have some tough road games running on their schedule. Texas Tech, Kansas State, Oklahoma State. None of those games are a guaranteed win. Um, Iowa State at home is the closest thing they have remaining to a, a surefire win. But at this point, can you really call anything that? I think we're going to see this team improve a lot, but they're just going to have to stop shooting themselves in the foot because I think, among all things, that might be the biggest issue. 
All right, well, thank you, Jeff, for your analysis on the Baylor game. We look forward to seeing you later in the show to talk some more football and the Red River Shootout. Thank you, guys. Coming up on College Press Box, the Texas volleyball team faced Iowa State and Kansas as they go to the Big 12, while softball started their season this past weekend. Stay tuned. We keep rolling along here on College Press Box. The Texas volleyball team hosted Iowa State last Wednesday in its Big 12 home opener, looking to keep its perfect start to the season alive. Let's go to Gregory Jim for the highlights. Number two, Texas facing Iowa State, looking to improve to 2-0 in conference play. We'll pick it up in the first set when Chiaka Abagu and Kat Bell combine for the block, put Texas up early. Here, Amy Neal serves and Haley Eckerman gets the kill. Texas goes up 11-9. And then Chloe Collins sets up the Amy Neal kill to put Texas up by two. Game point now, and Haley Eckerman gets the kill right here. Texas wins the first set. Set two now, Kat Bell and Chiaco Abagu combine for the block. Texas goes on to win that set as well. And then Kat Bell in the third set gets the kill. And here we are later in the third, Molly McCage and Kat Bell combining for the block right here. And Texas goes on to win three sets to none. Well, after the game, head coach Jared Elliott and Haley Eckerman talked about what they thought the team did against Iowa State. Yeah, I felt like we got in a good flow. I mean, our kill percentage went up significantly. I think your percentage does. And, you know, for whatever reason, we haven't been starting games that way. So those guys come out a little bit stronger. You can see a little bit more. Uh, you know, and I think that, I think, you know, maybe they were a, little, a rock a little bit from the last week. We won five games and just kind of expecting to win those games. And um, we just felt like they got a lot more comfortable. And, um, you know, it's always good to win. Later in the week, the Texas volleyball team traveled to Lawrence, Kansas to face the Jayhawks and took the win in four sets, whereas senior Cat Bell took the game with a season high of 15 kills. The Horns took an early lead in the first set, 13-5, ultimately winning the first set, 25-14. The second set, the Longhorns struggled early, tying four times before taking the set, 25-20. However, the Horns trailed in the third set majority of the time and lost 20-25 trying to come back. But ultimately, they came back in the fourth set and took it 25-21 after a six-state straight point answer. The volleyball team will face Greg Baylor in the Gregory Gym this upcoming Tuesday. The Longhorns soccer team picked up its second Big 12 win of the season on Friday with its 1-0 victory over Iowa State. Coppell High School graduate Lindsey Meyer made my alma mater proud in scoring the lone goal for Texas to improve to 7-4-2 with the win. Brooke Gilbert picked up the assist for the Horns, while Abby Smith continued her solid play with three saves en route to the shutout. Texas will put its 2-1 conference record on the line this Friday when it hosts Kansas at 7 p.m. The Texas softball team took to the diamond for the first time this season facing McCullen Community High School. Five of their Horns pitchers came combined with a three-hit shutout and would gain a total 15, and that's right, 15 strikeouts against McClellan. 5-0, and it was scored 5-0 and at the end of the game, with sophomore Kelly Hansel going 2-2 two and two with two RBIs. Texas opened the scoring ways at the bottom of the second with a double from Hansel to let Tierra Davis and Tevin Tooney score the first two runs and a single from Stephanie Wong to let Hansel score. Texas will score two more times in the third and fifth innings, and they will play Incarnate War next on October 19th. We're going to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. Seriously, put down the remote. It's College Press Box. Welcome back to College Press Box. We'll now have Jeff Barker again joining us in the studio to talk some more big games this past weekend and the Red River Shootout game. So, Jeff, let's go get started. We're going to go first to Iowa State and Oklahoma State. Iowa State kept up with Oklahoma State in the first half, but ultimately losing 37-20. Iowa State looks like they're going to be the weak link for Big 12. Are they just bad, or is Oklahoma State a team to watch out for this season? Hey, Iowa State, not a great team, but don't speak too soon on them being the weak link. Texas looks like... It could be the doormat, too, in the, in the Big 12 right now. Uh, but as far as Oklahoma State, I think they're uh, 
a great team. I think they're probably going to finish third or fourth. That's where I see them finishing right now in the Big 12. Uh, and simply just because road games, and the Big 12 schedule ahead is, is really tough. Road games against TCU, K-State, Oklahoma, and Baylor. And they finish with Baylor and Oklahoma back-to-back -back on the road. I mean, those are going to be two tough games to finish with. Also, Dax Garman, he's playing well so far, but I mean, um, J.W. Walsh got injured in the Florida State game, and that was really the only tough defense, or even good defense at all, really, that they've played so far. So Dax Garman, it'll be interesting to see how he progresses going forward the rest of the season when they start to play some tougher defenses. I think they're a legitimate contender. I really like Dax Garman. Going back to his high school days, he was one of the biggest recruits, uh, even bigger than J.W. Walsh, in fact. I think that this is a team that if they put it together, they could be really balanced. They played very well defensively. We saw it against Florida State, and they held Iowa State to less points than, than uh, what Baylor did a couple weeks ago. I think this Oklahoma State team is balanced. They can score like a Big 12 offense, and their defense has shown flashes. If they can continue to put it together and win games on the road, I think this is a team that could legitimately contend for the conference. Okay. Well, let's talk to Kansas State and Tech. Texas Te Kansas State took care of Texas Tech 45-13, and is now in the AP's top 25 as number 23. What does this mean for the Wildcats, Jeff? I mean, that was a big win for K-State. I mean, Tech, not a great team, not a great defense to put up 45 on them, but still to hold their offense to 13 points is big. I mean, any big-time win in a conference game, um, you know, like they had against Texas Tech on Saturday is a big one. Um, but, you know, when I, when I look at uh, Kansas State, I think they're a legit contender. Uh, like I said, put him right around Oklahoma State because Jake Waters, playing well at quarterback, he tops off a list of some senior guys that are experienced, some playmakers on the offensive side of the ball with receivers, Tyler Lockett, Curry Sexton. So I see them, you know, potentially, you know, if they can knock off a, a Baylor in Oklahoma, maybe end with one loss, win a tiebreaker at the end of the season, something like that. I could see them potentially winning the Big 12. Yeah. Okay. I'm not as high on Kansas State. <laughs> uh, you know, I just don't think their ceiling is, is, is as high as Oklahoma State or some of the other teams in this conference. I like Jake Waters, but I think he kind of topped out a little bit last year. He was a very average quarterback, and he hasn't really improved much this year. I think the ceiling is a little lower. I do think they deserve to be ranked, but I don't think that they're going to finish any better than fourth in the conference. I think they're going to struggle when they have to go on the road. I mean, it is tough to play in Manhattan, but when they have to go on the road against some of the better teams, I don't, I'm not convinced that they're really going to be able to keep on, keep on playing the way they have in the last few weeks. They're going to make a lot of noise, but as a Big 12 contender, I, I, I'd have to agree with you. I just don't I, think I, their I offense it. holds up in the Big 12. No, so the, the uh, potential statement game, a 20-14 to 14 loss uh, at home to Auburn, a team that just beat LSU 40, 41 to 7, uh, you guys don't think that means anything? I just think that's the way that Auburn matches up against teams. They usually don't outscore them by too much. I know they did against LSU, but maybe LSU is a little overrated. Usually yeah. Auburn's going to keep it close. They're not going to score a ton. They're not even top 70 in passing, but their defense is good enough. Kansas State, uh, they kind of match up similarly against them. And I think the fact that they weren't able to get that one, I mean, it's going to cost them as, as far as people giving them the benefit of the doubt, I think. I'd have to agree with Peter on this one. But due to take of time, I, we will go straight into the next game. OU and TCU. This game was considered one of the biggest upsets of the, for college football. Tech TCU defeated the then number four Oklahoma Sooners 37-33. What do you think happened to the Horn Fox to beat one of the best teams in the country, and how do you think it will play out for Texas next weekend? I mean, TCU r really looked good on, on both sides of the ball. You look at Trevon Boykin on offense, passed for over 300 yards, almost rushed for 100, uh, threw in a couple touchdowns. Their offense put up 31 points. On uh, their defense, though, that was what actually won it for them. They forced two turnovers on Trevor Knight, uh, one of which ultimately won him the game, gave him that 37-33 lead after the uh, PAT on the pick six was blocked. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think TCU is a good team. And Oklahoma still, I mean, I wouldn't look too much into this loss. I mean, I think they're, they're still a top team. But I think we just learned more about TCU than Oklahoma, maybe. I think the, better, the bigger storyline is how much Oklahoma struggled. I haven't been high on Oklahoma all year, and they kind of showed why. Sure, they have a talented defense, but they'll give up points. Yes, they have talented playmakers on offense, but I think Trevor Knight holds them back. Uh, this year, he's thrown five touchdowns, five interceptions in five games. That's a terrible ratio, only completing 54% of his passes. I think TCU is the first legitimate defense he's faced, and I think Oklahoma fans, as much as you don't want to, you might have to get used to this because this is how Trevor Knight's going to play against better defenses. Sometimes he'll play well, and sometimes his playmakers are going to be able to bail him out a little bit, but overall, this guy's a middle-of-the-pack quarterback, in my opinion, and until he proves otherwise, I think that Oklahoma might not be as great as teams, uh, people thought they were coming into the season. Okay. Sean has some input on what the f football team needs to do for the game, while Tyrone talks about how it will be for him to actually play in this Red River shootout.
Florida State, but, but Texas and Oklahoma rival is a special rival. And we know how big it is. No, I had to say much to the players this week. Don't have to worry about them being down. They know what's at stake here. But I think it'll be a lot different actually being on the field and standing on the sidelines just watching. In those games, the first five minutes is a blast because you know everybody's coming with what they have, whether it be a trick play or whatever. Because somebody's trying to get the momentum early, so they're going to try to get a quick score, whatever they need to get, to you know to get you back on your heels. So we had to be aware of it. We had to be smart in how we play and how we prepare for this game. Okay, Jeff, as we all know, Texas will be heading to Dallas if they face their rival, University of Oklahoma. What are your keys to success for Texas to come home with a win? And what is your prediction for the game? Well, I kind of see this one playing out similar to how the Baylor game played out. I think the Texas defense will continue to pick up where they left off, continue their strong performance. I think they'll not necessarily completely shut Trevor Knight and Samaj P. Ryan in that, that solid running game. And um, I don't think they'll completely shut those guys down. But I'm interested to see who Vance Bedford is going to put on Sterling Shepard. Shepard caught two touchdowns, over 200 yards receiving last week against TCU. He's a huge weapon, definitely going to be the best receiver uh, that Texas has faced all year. So it'll be interesting to see how they play them in the passing game. But I see that defense playing pretty well. Um, so as far as the defense, keys, keys to victory for them. Just keep playing the way they're playing. And then offense, obviously, it's, I mean, it's simple. They have to score. I mean, they, they have to put up points. They have to help that defense out. And I think that starts with establishing a good running game like they were able to do last week. And then it ultimately finishes with Tyrone being able to learn from his mistakes last week, limit the turnovers, and put some points on the board, move the ball, um, get, just move the ball down the field, score some points. Okay. Well, thank you, Jeff. It is always a pleasure to have you in studio with us. Have a great weekend, and I know you'll be at the OU game. Stay safe, my friend. Thanks for having me, guys. Coming up in the final quarter of College Press Talks, we'll take a look at what's occurring around the 40 acres, and also we'll give our own predictions for the Texas OU game. Stay tuned. And we're back on College Press Box. Thanks again for spending your Monday evening with us. Hey, our very own Victoria Rodriguez talked to the people of Austin this week about all of the sports world's most pressing topics. Let's roll this week's edition of Man on the Street. Michael Phelps arrested again in an all-female sports talk show. We went to the 40 acres to ask students their opinions on this week's breaking sports news. So CBS Network recently launched an all-female sports talk show, and a lot of women in the media are saying that this is not fair because they should be included in already established shows and they should not have to create their own show. What do you think about this? I, I generally agree with that. I think that there's no reason for the segregation of men and women in sports shows that should be included. In I'm, uh, I'm kind of straddling the fence with this topic. I think that it, it is okay. Like, yes, you know, women, that's the, you know, that's the step, you know, having your own TV show. But then I do think that, you know, we should be included in what's already made, you and know. recently, Michael Phelps got arrested for possession of marijuana. This will be his third um, incident with drugs. Do you think he should be participating in the Olympics? I definitely don't think he should be participating in the next Olympics because at the end of the day, it's all about discipline. So I feel like if you can't display that, then how will you go out there to display, like to represent for America? So I feel like that's not a good representation. Victoria Rodriguez, College Press Box. Now we'll take a look at this week in Longhorn Sports. All right, well this Monday, women's golf will be at the Schooner Fall Classic. Tuesday, volleyball will be hosting Baylor and the Gregory Gymnasium, 7 p.m. here at Longhorn Network. Then also Monday through Wednesday, the men's golf will be at the Nike Golf Collegiate Invitational. And then Thursday, men's, um, women's volleyball will be at Texas State. We'll be here at Texas State, 7 p.m. on Longhorn Network. Busy weekend for the Longhorns, too. Friday, soccer takes on Kansas right here, 7 p.m., Longhorn Network. Saturday, uh, I think you guys know the football game against Oklahoma, 11 a.m. on ABC. Saturday uh, and Sunday, women's, text, women, women's tennis excuse me, is at the Sklyfe Tennis Invite, and Sunday, women's golf is at the Betsy Rawls Invitational. Hey, before you go, Matthew McConaughey stopped by Longhorns practice last week, and even though it didn't help Texas win, it's nice to see the Academy Award winner getting hyped up with Charlie Strong's team. This video has been surfing the web of him doing the Wolf of Wall Street fist bump at practice. He says he does it to loosen himself up and as a way to keep people guessing about what he's doing. 
Favorite movie I ever made? Mud. Mud. I also like that Wolf of Wall Street, though. We got it. <laughs> All right, let's get it going one time, right? That's just some, that's just very funny. Okay, like Peter, it. the moment of truth. What do you think will be the final score of this Red River shootout game? You know what? I'm going to go 31-14. Oklahoma's going to win. I think it's going to be a very similar game to what we saw last time. Maybe Texas gets another offensive touchdown, but I think all in all it's going to be a relatively low-scoring game, but Oklahoma's going to come out by a couple scores. I have to agree with you. I think it will be a low-scoring game, but I don't think the Texas offense will be able to push up enough points to win this game. Mm -hmm. So I have Texas winning 24-3. to All right. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you for you. Thank you guys for tuning in with us. You can always catch us here Mondays at 930. And you can always get the latest sports news around the 40 acres. You can follow us on Twitter at College Press Fox. And be sure to tune in to our sister show, College Crossfire, for the best and latest of the sports debates in around the 40 acres, Wednesdays at 9. Be sure to also follow them at College X Fire. From all of us from Mass Control and Studio, thank you and have a great week.